103. Lug Bomer. So really, Lug Bomer has become very uh, much an event. Even though uh, it's not really a major holiday. It's not. What are the three holidays from the Torah? The three. Well, when I say three, I'm giving you a hint. Pesach, Shavuot, and, and Sukkot. Those are the three holidays where we're supposed to go up to the Beit HaMikdash. And then there's also biblical holidays. Okay. Well, what, what did you say? Uh, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. So that's five, right? Those are the ones mentioned in the Torah. Then we have rabbinic holidays. Purim and Hanukkah. That's it. Purim and Hanukkah. That's it. Then we have fast days. Of course, we're not going to talk about the fast days. But in terms of festivals, that's it. We know that there's a little bit of a festive feeling on Rosh Chodesh over the course of history that changed a little bit. There's a little bit of festivity on um, Pesach Sheni we just had. The other day we don't say Tachna. And there's a little bit of festivity on Lag Bomer too. We don't say Tachna. Uh, that's how Rav, Rav Melamed starts off. Let's, let's put this in perspective. It is customary, custom, not a law, it's not the right, not the rabbana, it's a custom, to rejoice somewhat, unlike Bomer. Even though we, re- now it's significant because, you know, even though we observe some customs of mourning during the Omer period, nevertheless, one may sing and dance unlike Bomer. Tachnun is recited neither on Lag Bomer nor in Mincha the preceding day. One may not fast on Lag Bomer, so we have some elements of festivity. And of course, the excitement is that we, it's a break in the uh, customs of mourning, which we have during the Sfirat Omer. But other than that, it was never really a major holiday, a major event. However, Baruch Hashem, Judaism develops, Judaism is alive and dynamic. And sometimes days which were not so significant in the past take on new meanings, take on, get greater emphasis than they did in the past. And over the course of the last few hundred years, we see that Lug Bomer has gained prominence. I don't think, I think I might have mentioned to you the other day the prominence uh, of Bar Kochva and the connection to, to Lug Bomer and the Rabbi Kiva students and. Uh, uh, Rabbi Kiva and Ra- Rabbi Shum Rachai was one of the students. Also, the early Zionists, maybe he's going to, Rabbi Malamud will mention this, they wanted to connect to the Jewish tradition, even though they're very strange because of the Enlightenment. And uh, so they, they tried to pick and choose from each festival what they connected to most. Shavuot coming up, what did they connect to? Not chicken soup, the, not, not the, ch- not the, the cheesecake. No, no, not the, the wheat, the, the agriculture. Of course, it's the festival of the harvest, of the, gra- of the grain, for sure. And it became a very, uh, because they were starting up the agriculture in the land of Israel. Each holiday, they found something to connect to Pesach's easy freedom. It's always good against the bad guys. Uh, Sukkot is a little bit harder, and that's why it was less uh, celebrated. Um, uh, they, it was hard for them to connect to. Allah, Hanukkah, of course, the might of the Hasmonean rebels. And uh, when it came to Lag Baomer, here they really identified with the might of Bar Kokhba, the rebels. Again, I think I sent you, I don't know if anybody got a chance to look at the coins, which were just found near my house from the Bar Kokhba time. This was a declaration of independence the last, essentially, independence we had until we came back to the modern era, until we came back to Israel in the modern era. So Bar Kokhba became a, uh, a very popular hero in Israel, and this, became, this took a lot of, uh, this became much more prominent, and of course it's a lot of fun for the children to make a bonfire. Let's see why the bonfires. It so much became such a central day, do you know, that in Israel, it's, it's amazing when you come from, I grew up in, in uh, Canada, and we had, of course, I went to a Jewish school, a religious family, went to a Jewish private school, very, very expensive, but of course, you had, need to get a Jewish education. 
But we had school during Chol HaMoed, Pesach. We had school whenever there's not a, a, a festive day that you're not allowed to do work. And um, of course we had school on uh, Lagba Omer. Here in Israel, there's no school on Lagba Omer. Why? Well, there's a very strong teachers union. That's probably the real reason. But the, the, uh, the, unofficial, the, the official reason is because, of course, all the children have to do bonfires on the night of Lagba Omer. It's like a mitzvah, secular mitzvah. You have to have a bonfire. And somehow kids really like bonfires and they stay up all night long. And if they're staying up all night long, they can't get up for school in the morning. And so there's no school. This is true today. You're here in Israel. There's no school on Nagba Omer. All the parents who go to work because it's really, it's not that big of a festival. They're stuck because their kids have, you know, if they're small kids, they need somebody to watch them and so forth. It's quite a, a phenomenon, a fascinating phenomenon in Israeli society. So Lagba Omer, uh, that's, what, that's one reason why it became more, more central, because of the unique uh, development in Israeli society. Another reason, and this might be connected to Israeli society, might not be, um, is the resurgence in interest in Kabbalah. A tremendous uh, move towards mysticism, and Lagba Omer is associated with Rav Shimon Bar Chai and the Zohar, and we'll see why in just a minute. But, um, and so, not only the kids stay up all night at bonfires, but uh, many, many, I think it's the largest until this year, unfortunately. Uh, the, the last year, every Lagba Omer was the yeah, largest right. Jewish gathering ever. They say hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Some years they say they estimated 800,000 people. Maybe not on the day of Lag Bomer, but throughout the, the, it became a festival of a whole week. People would go up to Miron and celebrate with bonfires. An unbelievable phenomenon. It never happened before Lag Bomer. The, the Jewish people, customs of going up to Lag Bomer started really to, to Miron, to go up to Miron, to the, the, the gravesite of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, only uh, the last 200 years. And, and really, only in recent times. In the last 30 years, did it actually become such a popular big event? So this is a recent phenomenon, but the idea, I think it's, it's connected to uh, the fact that we have more leisure time and that we're more interested in, in uh, the mystical side of Judaism, which we're going to talk about a little bit later and uh, tomorrow. Yes, Moshe. Hey, uh, I have a question about the bonfires. So um, the, um, the what are the halachas? You're asking um, me, right? Well, so there's no halachas. There is halacha. There's, halacha. there's no halacha. There's a, there's, a, there's a new halacha that I just read. The great poskim that we call the Knesset have said, went on and said, oh, if you will light a bonfire, you will get a very steep, steep fine. They just make, I just read on the news. Oh, no. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. That's not true. That's not true. That's a lot of misinformation, and a lot of people are very uh, upset. And there's some people that are so upset with... With Zionism, I'll explain. They're so accepted with the Zionists, and they're, 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 um, they've turned them into the en enemy, that anything that the Zionists do must by necessarily be, be bad. And as a matter of fact, you know, I'm a proud Zionist, and I think the government is, is, uh, has very, many, many things to fix in the way that the government rules the country, but it's tremendous amazing benefits that we have and the tremendous uh, Kiddush Hashem first of all that we have a Jewish government but even what the government is trying to do, I don't believe that the government is against the Jewish, the Jewish religion I don't think they're trying to get us, they're trying to keep us safe and as I said last year was probably the last one of these amazing 800,000 people gatherings of the Jewish people because 45 people were killed in a stampede because the government didn't take enough responsibility for the site where people go in Miron, and uh, it was not safe enough. And uh, they're cracking down. I hope they'll be cracking down this year. I hope I'm on the side of the government. So whatever they what they publicize before Miron, before Lag Bomer about the bonfires, it's for the sake of safety. There's they say you're not allowed to light bonfires anywhere and everywhere because of the fire hazard. 
There is actually in every city, in every, in every, the government designates places where you can and should have, have bonfires. It's not that the government's against the religious Jews. The opposite. They're just trying to keep everybody safe. Do it, do it practically. It's, it's a fascinating phenomenon. Uh, when you fly, uh, one of our uh, students here is flying back to Israel. Uh, I thought it was going to be flying uh, tonight. If you fly over Israel, you, the whole, it looks like the whole country is on fire. You can actually see it from outer space, the bonfires. Uh, they're so large, unlike Bomer. So uh, it's obviously a, a dangerous situation. And so the government's trying to get a little bit of a control so that we don't kill ourselves. That's all. I don't think the government's you know, against anybody who's trying to uh, celebrate like Bomer. But let's, um, let's go back to the uh, chapter at hand, page 103. We have it. We'll see how Merlab presents this package that we started to talk about. Uh, the, the starting point is, what are you doing on Lag Baomer? What do you have to do on Lag Baomer? Good. <laughs> Nothing. Good, good. What did I say? Uh, what, what, what was the other day that we spoke about? Um, um, not Pesach Sheni before that. What did we have? It was a day... No, Yom Atzmud I celebrated with, with great fanfare. But before that, there was a day which was like a minor festival that some people celebrated... Um, I'm trying to remember what was it. Uh, hmm? No, 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 no. Uh, months ago, months ago. Anyways, what do you do on a Pur, uh, uh, um, Purim Katan? Purim Katan. Yes. The fourteenth of Adar. The second Adar is the real Purim. That's when we celebrate. The first Adar. The first Adar. What do we do? What do you do? You don't say tachum. Nothing. Nothing. You don't have to do anything. The, the way we celebrate is just not saying tachum. Lag bomber is on the same status, really. Halachically. It's not, there's nothing to do. You just, now, of course, that's on the bare bones halacha. Of course, as I said, our lives, our religious lives are much richer when we uh, try to appreciate the character of each day and actually go with it. But don't, we don't consider it on the same level as you must blow the shofar and you must sit in a sukkah and you must light the Hanukkah candles. There's, there's no musts here by, by Lag Bomer. The only thing you must do is not say Tachman. Okay? Okay? So let's, let's read it inside. Uh, page 103. The reason we rejoice, uh, Moshe, why don't you read for us? Page 103, uh, the second paragraph. The reason we rejoice. The reason we rejoice in Lago Omer is that the Rishonim had a tradition that the students of Rabbi Akiva stopped dying on the 33rd day of the Omer. Some explain that the students actually continued dying throughout the 33rd day of the Omer. Rabbi Akiva began teaching new students, including Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who did not die in the plague, and through them, Torah spread among the Jewish people. This is why we rejoice in Lago Omer. Others claim that on the 33rd day of the Omer, Rabbi Akiva, conferred rabbinic coordination on his five new students, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Ye Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and Rabbi Eliezer ben Shamua. Stop there for a second. Here's number five. Yeah. Rabbi Eliezer El Azar ben Shamua. El Azar ben Shamua. Rabbi Eliezer ben Shamua. Thank you. Continue the tradition from Torah. Another reason for rejoicing in Lama Omer is that it is the yard site for Hilula of the Holy Tana Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who was Rabbi Yosef's disciple. We will first summarize briefly the customs of mourning and rejoicing the five Lama Omer. Why summarize? Because we studied them already in the previous chapter when we talked about Sfirat Omer. We studied in great detail. There's Ashkenazi custom, the Sephardi custom. This is a super nice summary. If you don't remember what we learned, I think it was last week, when we started talking about Sfirat Omer in greater depth, we learned, uh, here's a nice summary, okay? According to all customs. Okay, uh, according to all customs, one may sing, dance, and play musical instruments on Lago Omer, from beginning to end. Regarding weddings and haircuts, the matter depends on one's custom. According to the customs of Ashkenazic and some Sephardic communities, one may get married and cut one's hair on the day of Lago Omer, and some permit these activities even at night. According to the custom of most Sephardic, however, one may not get married or cut one's hair on Lago Omer. Nonetheless, what, one, only the day after Lago Omer. Not on Lag Bomer, but the day after Lag Bomer. So Sephardim wait one more day until the 34th, right? That's what we saw. Nonetheless, when Lag Bomer falls out on a Friday, one day cut one's hair in honor of Shabbos, even according to Sephardic custom. Those who follow the customs of Arizal do not cut the hair on Lag Bomer, even in this situation, because they were bringing the hair throughout the Omer period until the of Shabbos. Okay, that was a nice brief summary of the halachot. Bottom line is most 
Uh, all co all, cust all co customs uh, sing and dance. They permit singing and dancing, unlike Bomer. After many didn't, well, we didn't have weddings for sure, uh, according to all customs during this part of the Omer period. And uh, weddings, we spoke about, some people permitted even the eve of Lagba Omer, like tonight, there's, there's many weddings, but it's only Ashkenazim really. Sephardim, not even tomorrow night do they permit it, they wait until the 34th day, although there's, you know, uh, there's some flexibility there. And uh, some people are machmir not to have weddings throughout the, uh, the, shav the, the entire Omer period. But uh, if you plan to get married, you'll have to consult with a rabbi during this period, as soon as possible. All right, now let's go into the content of Lag Bomer itself. Number two, David, go ahead. The Hilula. Yes, the Hilula of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Many people have the custom to spend Lag Bomer on their own. The Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in Roshni and his son Rabbi Elazar of Aparet. There, there they enjoy greatly Lag Bomer sing and dance. Participants in these celebrations include righteous individuals and Torah scholars. Some great Torah authorities have doubted the legitimacy of this practice. After all, how can we establish a festival on a day when no miracle happened and that the sages did not institute as other? While it is well known that we do not recite the Hanun or Fasan that moment, there is no known source indicating that it is a holiday. This is the Khatam Sofer. He really, he heard that there were some people going up to Meiron and making it. I'll tell you, there's one other problem. I don't know if he mentions it. A lot of people are upset about this nowadays. Uh, if you have a consciousness of the greater picture of Judaism, people speak about going up to the Regel, to Meiron. What are they doing? They're replacing, exactly, they're replacing Jerusalem with Meiron. We're supposed to come to Jerusalem for the central religious uh, worship and, and, and the congregation. And also, we don't have a temple, I understand, but we can't replace it. We can't say, oh, we're all going to go to Meron. It's, like it's like a new religion. It's very, it's very strange. The question is also, why are they going to I know why, but you know, of course, they were very, like, they were in Tzong, but they Right. And some people even, like, pray directly. Oh, that's what he's going to talk about a little more. But, but the, the concept of, of, of connecting to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and everything that he represents, that is what, that what the, the positive things we can take out of this. This is what we're looking for. The positive content of Lag Bomer. Without the practice of, you know, you don't have to go to Miron. You can go to Miron any other day without hundreds of thousands of people, without any danger to, to uh, you know, trampling and, and uh, cra overcrowding. Uh, but... This is a custom that developed, and uh, if it wasn't dangerous, it's not really uh, harmful to, to go and visit the graves of, of the, the holy Tana, of Shem Yechai and his son, and to, to uh, study there, to pray there. Great rabbis go, well, once the great rabbis go, I want to go see the great rabbi. I want to pray together with the great rabbi. You have to be careful who you're praying to, but... Uh, the concept of having a spiritual gathering is not a bad one. There's details which are, which are weird here. The details are where is it, when is it, how is it, but the concept of gathering together for a religious uh, festival is terrific. Uh, yeah. I have some Sephardi friends from Iran, and they, they go there, and uh, uh -huh. they, when I talk with them, they told me that they, if you go on the grave of the Sadi, then sometimes the miracles happen. That's right. There's a lot of beliefs how is associated. That, how we should do, uh, I was kind of like looking mm. at it, but mm. I, I, I didn't know how to relate to it, really. <laughs> right. Um, so there are different streams, different approaches uh, in, in Judaism and regarding... They even say the story, sorry. They even say the story about the healing of some person. And right, and right. Like that. That's right, that's right. Some people are, are um, um, they tell a lot of stories of, um, sort of almost like magical uh, powers that certain rabbis have, that certain uh, moments have, that certain practices have. Uh, they're called in, in, in uh, Hebrew, segulot, a segula in singular. Segulot, a segula means essentially a... Uh, a special practice that has special powers. There's a segula to uh, protect yourself. Like a ritual or 
L L what? A ritual, a ritual which which has has special powers. Some people say, you know, we all know that it's a mitzvah to eat matzah on Pesach. Right? In the night of the Seder, we even eat two pieces of matzah. The last piece is called, on the Seder night, the afikoman. There's a tradition, if you save a little piece of the afikoman in your house, the house is protected for the entire year. You have protection. Right? It's a segula. It's a type of practice which uh, many people... Now there's, there's, there's no end of these segulot. It's a little bit tricky. The chamsa, chamsa, exactly. The truth is this, this uh, five uh, sort of imprint of a hand with five fingers. From what I understand, that's actually its sources in Arab countries. It's not necessarily a Jewish custom that's from, from all over. And people, people hang that for protection. A uh, red string. Yes. The red string. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Uh oh. The red uh oh. I was here on birthright. Yes. Yes. Why well, do you care? Okay. Yeah. Some people say it's a segula. It gives you blessing. It brings you protection. Who made that up? The problem is, I'm not going to make light of anybody's, you know, beliefs. The problem, I think, is yeah, it's very, it sounds like superstition, right? The, the, the problem that I have, the major problem I have that is when people start making money with these things. They take away innocent people's money. People will spend money. You probably bought that red string, right? Half a shekel. Half a shekel. There you go. Okay, but a half a shekel adds up. I can take a red string and, and divide it up and get, if I, you know, it costs me zero shekels. And that, but if I give a half a shekel for each, one, each little piece that I sell, I make a lot of money. And there are some people... Unfortunately, some people that have. If it's for tzedakah, good. Some people, unfortunately, they even have they, they go around with the title rabbi, and they sell segulot. A rabbi X gives a blessing over this water, and it's the same water that. You buy the Makola for five shekels, but it can be yours for only 50. This is blessed water from the rabbi. So it could, it could have some effect. Uh, there, there, there is the concept. What did we learn yesterday? We learned that they're, they're, the rabbis <coughs> had powers to make miracles. The holy Tanaim, Rabbi Eliezer, right? He made the, uh, the tree uprooted. He made the, the, the river run downstream. Or upstream, the opposite. And uh, he made the walls. And Rabbi Yeshua stopped the walls from falling down. The rabbis had spiritual power. <coughs> we believe that uh, if somebody is connected up above, then he can, uh, he can affect. Uh, we, uh, we all believe in prayer. We pray three times a day. Prayer is a way that we can affect how God runs the world. It's not so simple. And my prayers are perhaps not as valuable as somebody who's a great, great tzaddik, who's a, a pious man. Maybe he has greater powers of prayer. So maybe I'm going to pay him to pray for me. So whenever you get money involved, it causes corruption. And you get people who are charlatans. And you get people who really have no spiritual power whatsoever. They make up segulot, which have nothing. I saw people selling. Now there's, there's actually an organization that makes a lot of money every year around Lagba Omer. They're called Or Harashbi. The light of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. That's the name of the organization. And every year they come up with a new scheme, and they publish, you know, Chrome booklets, which cost a lot of money, and they were full of stories of miracles. I did this, and this year the scheme was the candle of Rashbi. You can buy this candle, and it brings you everything you need: healing. It brings you uh, a livelihood. It brings you uh, finding the right uh, match. Uh, you know, you should have a spouse. They, it, every, and they, they say, this is, they have no shame. They actually write black on white. And they say, this is miraculous. And if you only buy this candle, what do they do with the candle? They just buy some candles. Maybe they take it to, to, to Meron. Maybe they don't. Maybe they, the rabbi blesses them. Maybe he doesn't. But they make a lot of money off of this. And I think it's, it's actually a crime. And they should be prosecuted. Absolutely, it's a chilul Hashem. They're using the Torah as some kind of a superstition. 
And the Torah, we believe that there's mystical power. We believe that there's truth to the, to, to the Torah that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai taught and that he represents, and they've turned it into uh, snake oil, into, into uh, you I know. I remember uh, on this in college. Yeah. Uh, I was one, of my, one of my questions in my final exam, but I was talking about like, um, like alternative medicine in the United States, but it's basically the exact same concept. It's, it's you know. We can't put everything in the same basket. Not everything is nonsense. It's, 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 so. the way you're, the way you're describing it, it sounds like it very much fits in that basket mm. of you have this individual who claims to be very who, who claims holy, to be very spir- yeah, spiritual. spiritually wise, right. Right. and is the, if you purchase the products that I am selling you, right. you will reach enlightenment or happiness or cure. Correct. Yes, correct. Correct. Yes. Very similar. Yes. Not. That's right. That's right. No, but you mentioned the words alternative medicine. Now, um, usually what we like to say is complementary medicine, and there is that is you can't put them all in the same basket because what that does is there's there's uh, it takes from the tradition, traditional medicine of Chinese medicine, for example, where maybe they know something about you know how to heal people uh, with herbs or with whatever it is, and they they. Um, or with this, you know, types of massage, shiatsu, chiropractic, and, and all those, there's all these men. Some of them, uh, many, many uh, Western doctors are, are finding tremendous value in not instead of, but that's why I say not alternative, but complementary medicine. So it's hard. Aspirin comes from herbs that the Chinese know about. Okay, that's exactly. Right. Right. So the question is everything that we right. The question works or it doesn't. Okay. So the question is everything that we haven't been able to test and prove. Do we just say oh, it's nonsense, or do we say well maybe no, we, 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 it needs to be tested and proved. It needs to be tested and proved, but maybe if uh, there is um, people that try certain practices or certain uh, plants, substances, or herbs. Um, that uh, and they find it uh, successful. Maybe uh, you know. Maybe there's different types of people, right? The, the idea of having um, differentiated medicine for somebody of type A, you can do the study, and if you get all those people of type A, they'll have no effect, and you say, okay, it's all nonsense. But then there's another type of people, maybe a subsection of people who actually have a specific. They're, they're well, we'll call them type B or type C or D or whatever. There's a subset of people that for them. Wow, this medicine, whatever medicine, whatever this practice it is, that has tremendous effect. So it, uh, I'm careful not to throw everything out, everything that can't be proved I mean, by science. I'm throwing it out. Throw it out. But if it works, it can be proven to work if you test it. Not always, if you test it right. But it's hard but to if test, you test it. it is right. It, it takes a lot of money to test it, and there's there's you know there's all sorts of uh, interests of you know where where are you gonna put your money and test and where you're not going to test. And many things that haven't been tested, maybe they're true, but uh, maybe they're not. Whatever's been tested and it's been found to be bogus, throw it out. I'm, I'm not uh, a big believer in, in superstition or, or things that, um, that can't be proven. But I also have to have some humility to know that the Western world and the scientific method is not applied uh, in a vacuum. And uh, it's not all there is uh, the only way that we can approach life with uh, you know the pure rationalist and, and scientific method. So there's a lot more going on and that we don't know about. But uh, that's my, my personal approach. That I, I have a little humility. I'm, uh, but I'm 100%. I'm against this, the, the, these charlatans that are taking people's money, and uh, they're in, not. In medicine, we do have charlatans. <laughs> there are charlatans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, getting back to the topic at hand, though. The fact that there is spiritual power to a person, to, to a practice, to a rabbi, to his Torah, to his grave. There is a tradition within Judaism, going way back to the period of Chazal, that, uh, what does it say in the Torah? Where did the Miraglim go, the, the 12 spies? Wrong, yes. They went to Hebron. The, at least uh, Yeshua and Kalev went to Hebron. What did they do there? Our tradition tells us they went there to, to the graves of the forefathers. Why? Because there's spiritual power there, because they prayed there for the sake of the Jewish people. There's a connection there. It's hard to put everything in the, in, uh, and just you know, throw it all out, but we have to separate between the people. So that's why I say the first sign, the first sign of, of you know, danger, money. There's money involved. Also, there's tzaddikim who give brachot. 
People go to a, a, a holy person for, to get a blessing. And it could be that these, the, the blessings, there are, there are people with spiritual powers. I'm not, I, I don't know. I don't know to, to say yes. I don't know to say no. I think there is a tradition that spiritual people have powers. The first sign that it's bad news is if they take money for giving blessings. Okay? But that's, that, that's my opinion. That's, that's just my opinion. Let's go back to Rabbi Shimba Yochai and going up to Meron and why people do it. Uh, this, there, is, there is a tradition to go. It started, you know, going to Meron started only a couple hundred years ago and the Khatam Sofer was against it. He said, you don't make a festival out of Lagba Omer. Uh, we, all we do is Dorid Omer Say Tachna. But there's no indication that it's a holiday. There's no indication that we should go specifically to the Mount Meron, which is very far from Jerusalem. And so the Khatam Sofer was the first one who really uh, started to fight back or say, maybe this is not such a good idea. He was not in the majority. Majority of rabbis are going to continue with this custom and, and, and uh, celebrate Lagba Omer. And this idea of going to Meron on Lagba Omer has become very, very popular among great rabbis, not charlatans, but uh, very spiritual people. So... There's, there's tension here, there's a debate here, and uh, let's, let's Rav Melamed continue to speak, and then we'll see how he comes on and how he explains what we can maybe try to strive for on Lag Bomer, even though we know there's some other people that are, you know, maybe making money off of it. We're going to try to not focus on the bad, focus on the good, and let's see what, what, um, what good is associated with, with Lag Bomer. Okay, David, I stopped you in the middle, we're at the bottom of page 104, we're learning Rav Melamed's Pnine Alacha series, the book of Zemanim, and uh, it's chapter 5, section 2, bottom page 104. Go ahead. And if uh, anything that is an honor of the anniversary of Rabbi Shem by Christ's death, it would be more appropriate to fast, which is the custom of observance of the anniversary of the great sage of death. So why do people enjoy to celebrate the Hilula of Rabbi Shem by Christ? Yet, as long that many people, including great scholars and righteous individuals, celebrate and rejoice with the joy reserved for the thought. Even though the outside of the great individual is generally a sad occasion, the Kabbalist conveyed in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that he wanted people to rejoice on this matter. The Zohar called today of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's passing and he will not, a term linked to wedding celebrations. A person's level of intimacy with the Shekhinah in this world is akin to the true betrothal, whereas in the next world, the level of intimacy is more corporate, comparable to marriage. In this world, death is viewed as being exceedingly sad, and when a, when a righteous person dies, he leaves a void and the nation mourns, mourns his loss. In the supernal world, however, it is understood that everything is for the best. On the contrary, when a truly righteous person is freed from the shackles of this world, he can observe the full light of Torah. This is especially true of those sages who delve into the esoteric aspect of the Torah, for their primary engagement is with the inner light of Torah and the soul. So, as long as they remain within the confines of this world, its physical boundaries obscure the light of Torah and the soul. However, when they depart from this world and are released from its physical boundaries, the gates of wisdom and inner light are opened wide before them. Then they are able to understand fully the deep secrets they study during their lives. Already on the day they die, it is possible to discern that the walls and barriers of this world are fading away. Accordingly, Ibn al Suda relates that on the day Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai died, he revealed deep and wondrous secrets that he was not allowed to reveal beforehand, and he simultaneously cried and rejoiced. Therefore, the day that the righteous person dies is like a wedding, uh, like a wedding, because on that day he can co consummate his connection to the Shekinah and his Torah becomes a great source of illumination in the supernal brothers. Consequently, his disciples and successors in this world can better connect to the death of his Torah and esoteric teachings. Okay, stop there for a second. Look at that. Oh, Hashem. Atta roet mi shinimza. Amen. I want to send you a little uh, 
a little uh, story. I'm going to send it to the WhatsApp group. Do you have your phones on you? or? Uh, I mean, I could uh, read it out loud, but uh, you can follow along. It's not a Jewish source. I don't know where it came from. But it's a, it's a nice uh, image to, uh, to put together with what Rav Milam was speaking about, about when a, when a tzaddik dies. Is it sad or is it happy? So uh, who can read it for... Um, Amos, will you read it? From, from the phone? Yeah, from the phone, yeah. I'm standing on the seashore. Seashore. A ship, uh, a ship at my side spreads her white sails to the morning breeze and starts for the blue ocean. She is an object of beauty and strength, and I stand and watch her until at length she is only a ribbon ribbon, ribbon, ribbon yeah. of white cloud just where the sea and sky come to join each other. Then someone at my side say, there, she's gone. Gone where? Gone from my side, that is all. She is just as a large in mass and wool and spar as she was when she left my side and just as able to bear her load of living freight to the destination. Her, dimin her, diminishes, her diminished size is in me, not in her, for just at the moment when someone at my side says, there, she's gonna, she's gone. There are other boys ready to take up the glad shout. shout. There she came, she comes, and that is dying. Okay, so uh, it's a question of uh, perspective, right? Uh, the, seeing the bigger picture, this is uh, what, uh, what the Kabbalists are, are speaking about uh, regarding the death of Rav Shimon Bar Yochai. Um, not only that the, at the day of, at the, at his, uh, as his death is described in the Zohar, not only was he revealing great secrets at that day, but the concept is that uh, his soul remains and his soul reaches a higher place even. And... We spoke about the spiritual powers of of, of uh, holy tzaddikim. Then, uh, if they're even closer to the heavens, then they may even have greater spiritual powers in the world. And so, for us, uh, death usually is associated with sadness and and uh, mourning. But in the bigger picture, it may be a cause for rejoicing, and that's the 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 idea behind this hilula. This uh, celebration on, on the day that Rabbi Shimon uh died. Okay, a question someone wants to ask? Uh, um, I, have, uh, go ahead, go ahead. I have a question, but just it's <coughs> maybe then after that, <coughs> when we say it's kind of like on the topic. But we have a grave, different graves around where I'm living, like uh, for example, Samson and the grave of Samson and his father, I think. Mm. Is that the True, or is it just to, to remember him, or it's not maybe the tomb that King David's or the old city is a more famous example of that. So, my, a friend of mine, uh, an educator in the, my son's uh, school, a very funny man. He's a rabbi, but he like he's like a stand-up comedian, and he likes to tell the story that he went up north, and he sees an old Arab man, he's like building up a structure of stone and, and uh, cement. And, uh, and uh, he asks him, hey, how's it going? He starts talking to him. And he says, what are you doing? He says, Ani Yosef Sadiq. He didn't understand. He said, Ani Yosef Sadiq. Ani Yosef Sadiq. What does he mean? He's creating a, a memorial for a Sadiq. This memorial, then, the truth is, I'm being a little cynical here, but it's a well-known fact. There was a minister of religion in the state of Israel who was very smart and wise, and he said, we're fighting for the land, right? The Arabs claim it's not ours, it's theirs. Internationally, we have a lot of trouble. Everybody agrees that religious sites are holy. That can't be touched. You can't, you can't uh, you know, destroy religious sites. So he went around the country, and he made many, many sites into religious sites. What's the simplest way? You make a grave. 
You say, this is Shimshon's grave. This is Rabbi Eliezer's grave. This is uh, Rabbi Yehuda's grave. We have so many great rabbis who lived in the land of Israel and functioned here. Do we really have a tradition going back 2,000 years to exactly this point, this hill, this hilltop, and this, this uh, geographical location? Sure, They're strategically placed so that um, we, we, uh, it's part of the way that, I don't know how widespread this phenomenon was, but there's definitely um, a lot involved in declaring a specific site, a religious site, which has to be respected and so forth. And so there, there is, you have to have a discerning eye, take it with a grain of salt. The Kota, we know where it is, <laughs> okay? The Mad Temple Mount, there's no question. The, uh, the grave of David, though, we're not sure that's really where it is. Where explain the... to me he was likely a king. Like, where, where they say David's grave, he was likely a king. A king, but not the king. Not... The Davidic kings were actually in the city of David, uh, probably buried closer to where they are, or in the, the valley there, the valley next to it. But... Um, where, where Yad Avshalom is, where uh, Avshalom's tomb is. That makes sense that uh, maybe that's where the, 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 the kings of old were buried. But a lot of these, these uh, attributions... So why is, why is the, the grave of Samson where you live? Because that's where he hung out. That's where he... It says in the Shoftim. Uh, they're, they're, so it makes sense. We put the grave in that general region. Now, it could be that there is also traditions. There are, there are Jews who were always in the land of Israel. There were Arabs in the land of Israel who preserved traditions about a specific spot, a specific structure where I live in Tekoa. In the next hill over, which I can't get to because it's in the middle of Tukwa, there is a certain building which is known as the grave of Amos. You know, Amos the prophet was from Tekoa. We know that. Do I know it specifically at that spot and not where my house is? Maybe my house is directly on the grave of Amos, but I don't know. But it, it's, uh, um, there is importance to traditions, traditions which are um, passed down by name, even through Arabs. They, many times the Arab communities preserved the traditions for us. And they called this, you know, the Amos or certain uh, cities, which we know from 2,000 years ago. We know they were Jewish cities. Where was it? Where was the ancient Beitar we spoke about yesterday? Being the, Beitar being the, the uh, headquarters of Bar Kokhba Revelt, or the, the central city in, uh, right where I live, Gush Etzion, all the way from Herodian, like the, uh, the, the coins that were just found near, Her near the Herodian, all the way to the western side of Gush Etzion. Um, this was the area that Bar Kokhba was strongest. Where is Beitar? Where is the original Beitar? Well, there's right next to the modern city of Beitar, there's an Arab town called Batir. So the Arabs preserved the name Beitar in their town. They called their town, that it's been called Batir forever, for time immemorial, for probably a thousand years. And so the preservation of the general geographical area is, is, is quite significant. In terms of a specific structure and a specific tombstone, it's very hard to, uh, to know. It's very hard to know if we're going back thousands of years. Um, even, even the tombstone at, at uh, Har Meron of Rav Shimon Bar Yochai. It's a structure that was created many years ago, but Specifically, is, is, is that a grave? Some rabbis will allow a Kohen to enter. A Kohen's not allowed to go near a grave. Well, they say, well, I don't know really that it's a grave. <laughs> so the Kohen can go enter. Other rabbis say, no, if it's a tradition that this is a grave site, the Kohen name shouldn't go in. Even, uh, you know, if we have a tradition that Jewish people uh, for, for centuries have considered it to be a grave, so we have to take that into consideration as well. So we have to be a little bit uh, cautious. Um, but don't swallow every sign. You see a signpost. Here lies, you know, uh, Rabbi uh, Yochanan ben Zakkai. Not sure that this is, but it's, it's nice to have these signs. It's nice to have these places because we can use them to connect to these figures, to their life story, to their ideals and values. And by all means, many times I've stopped by one of these graves, 
and studied, taught about their personality. When we were in Hebron, for example, where did we go to? Up the hill, we went to a grave tombstone of, who was it? There was two people that buried there, Ruth and Boaz, right? Wasn't it? The grave of Ruth? Right. I think it was, I think it was, yeah, the grave, uh, the, uh, there was a building, right? We went in and we prayed a little, we said, we said, I'm not against praying, and I'm not against saying it per Tehillim. Is there any, any validity historically, archaeologically? Uh, is, there, is there anything to, to really base this idea that Root was buried at that specific uh, synagogue? I, I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. I take it with a grain of salt. But that's not important. Uh, I'm not a historian. I'm not, uh, we're here to pray to God. We're here to serve God, to worship Him. And so we make all these, these moments, events, places that will inspire us, that will help us connect, that help us identify. And I'm not against that, okay? Uh, as long as you're self-aware. Okay, so that's the answer to your question about the, the other grave sites. Let's continue with Rabbi Shim Bayechai, which is the primary uh, goal of this lesson. Page 106 at the top of the page. We're in uh, the middle of section 2. Go ahead. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who composed the Zohar, is unique in that even Jews do not, who do not understand the secrets of Torah celebrate his Hidula. This is how Lag by Omar became a day of celebration for the esoteric side of the Torah. Many people go out to mourn their own for Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's Hidula. The great scholars among them rejoice over the secrets that were revealed to them in his merit and in the merit of his disciples <coughs> and successors. Even though the masses who join the festivities do not understand the secrets of the Torah, they rejoice over the fact that the Torah is bigger than the sea, and that there are a great and that there are great scholars and righteous people who connect to its deep secrets, as this entire world of darkness is made slightly more pleasant because of them. Furthermore, the very rec recognition of recognition that there are deep secrets beyond this average person's comprehension generates humility and wisdom, and even the symbol of hope are elevated by virtue of this right. awareness. Uh, bottom line is, you, you, if you go to Meron and you come back inspired to be a better person, to be a better Jew, it's a good thing. And uh, some people associate this, right? What do we have coming up two weeks from Lag Bomer? Shavuot. Shavuot. What is Shavuot? We celebrate the receiving of the Torah at Har Sinai. Some people say that and Shavuot, we celebrate the reception of the, the uh, open Torah, the revealed Torah. And in Lag Baomer, two weeks earlier, we celebrate the giving of the hidden Torah, of the mystical parts of Judaism. It's like a Shavuot about the Kabbalah. And so it's Matan Torah. We're celebrating, receiving the Torah. We believe that most people believe that there are um, uh, there is a tradition, a Jewish tradition of of mystical secrets, of things uh, that we know that have been passed down to us all the way back to the prophets, who clearly were were spiritual people who had uh, divine wisdom. There were schools of prophets, sure, yeah. So since then, uh, what do you think? It all totally disappeared. We've been studying about the period of the sages. And saying, Lo Bashamayimi, it's not in heaven. It's not absolute. We say the same story, which talks about not in heaven, tells a story about Eliyahu coming to Rabbi Natan. <laughs> and it tells about the, the power that Rabbi Eliezer's prayer had. He just put down his head to say, Tachnon. Ouch. Who died? Rabbi Gamliel died when his wife didn't stop him from saying Tachnon. So the fact that spiritual power exists in the world, that, that doesn't contradict the fact that we're not going to be living our, our halachic Judaism by, you know, uh, miracles. We have now, essentially, you could say parallel tracks. We have the, the uh, system of, you know, how to practice Judaism, which is primarily decided by the rabbis. And we have also a tradition of mystical wisdom uh, and, and perhaps uh, that gives us inspiration, uh, powers of prayer, but um, it, it gets very interesting when those lines get blurred. 
you'll have some rabbis which will bring, in the middle of the halachic discussion, the Talmudic discussion, they'll say, but in the Zohar, it says otherwise. Whoa. Well, 90% the Zohar agrees with the, with the Talmudic uh, discussions. And there's, there's, but there are some places where there's a contradiction. What do you do then? So here there's uh, a few different approaches, but uh, for the most part, the mystical traditions are to be respected and to be considered very ancient, um, even if you don't understand them. If you, it's still something to celebrate, the fact that we have... Um, and, and I'll tell you one more thing. Now that we're living in the period that we're living in, call it redemption, call it the beginning of redemption, call it in gathering the exiles, call it we have more hope for the final redemption to come soon. Part of the tradition is that when Mashiach comes, or in the days of Mashiach, which if it's a period, an era, prophecy will come back to the Jewish people. So perhaps we have to open ourselves. Rav Cook himself wrote a book, wanted it published, that every yeshiva student should study Kabbalah as well as studying the Talmud and, and the, the, the revealed parts of Torah, should also involve himself in the hidden parts of the Torah. Many of his students tried to hide that. They were against it. Rav Tzvi, his own son, Rav Tzvi Yehuda, Cohen Cook, didn't allow open study of Kabbalah in the yeshiva. They were much more, uh, much more circumspect when it comes to how widespread should be the study of Kabbalah. But you can't deny that Rav Cook himself wrote about it, taught about it. He himself was a major Kabbalist. He was just a, you know, a genius in both worlds. Rav Cook, the, the, the um, chief rabbi of Israel, he was, he was uh, well known to be the greatest scholar of his time, both in the revealed areas of Torah, in Halakha, and, and also in, in, in Kabbalah as well. He was a great, a great Kabbalist. So um, uh, maybe, you know, it's time to, to put a little more emphasis on, on the, the mystical sides of Judaism as well. Uh, but of course, here we are. We're in the... Um, I'd say Judaism 101. We're in the, the beginner's class, right? We're, we're, we're learning about the fundamentals of Judaism. So we're learning about it. But I wouldn't say you should spend all your time studying the Sfirot and the works of the Arizal before you know how to keep Shabbat. And the difference between, you know, a kosher bird and a non-kosher bird and, and you know, the details of, of how to say your prayers and the, the, the brachot properly there's a time and place for everything. You can't uh, jump ahead of yourselves and uh, pretend that, uh, well, even if you're interested in it, I'm not, a, I, in principle, I'm not against. Everybody should study the areas of Torah which, which they feel drawn to, but it has to be put in the proper, uh, in the proper framework, in the proper perspective. So, you, but you, so Lag Bomer can be a day of appreciating the mystical part of Judaism, even though you're not uh, uh, too much engaged in it and you don't really understand uh, anything about it, uh, we can appreciate that God gave us such a rich and deep Torah that has a revealed part and a hidden part. Okay? Um, now, the next, the next passage, I was actually, uh, that's why I was up trying to photocopy uh, I wanted to read with you Shabbat 33b, but I see that Rav Melamed has it almost word for word on page 107. So let's proceed and study some Talmud together, because the Talmud tells many, many stories about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, but we'll start at page 106, and then we'll continue, because the, the entire page is essentially a page of Talmud. It's a Midrash that comes from the Talmud, just like we learn the Midrash about Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua and the miracles which they could perform. Apparently there were some miracles about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that tells you about the context. It puts it also in the context of the Romans persecuting them, like we spoke about yesterday. The Bar Kochva revolt, Rabbi Akiva being, being killed, tortured by the Romans. This is the uh, period that we're, uh, we've been discussing, the period of the sages. Let's proceed. Okay, will you read for us, uh, Micha, a little bit? The bottom of page 106, number three, the personality of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. 
Versnellte Rabbishman Bar Yochai. Bevor we elaborate on the customs of the Helula, we will briefly discuss the unique character of Rabbishman Bar Yochai and his mentor, Rabbi Akiva. In general, the sages tended to act according to the middle path, taking into consideration the difficulties that commonly arise in this world. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, however, however, had to the absolute truth without considering the real limitations of this world. Therefore, miracles were performed on his behalf, and he met with success in his endeavors. One expression of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's approach pertains to Boron's rule over Eretz Israel. The sages thought that the Jews should pray for the welfare of the kingdom on the whose rule he lives, and they tried to do the best of their ability to avoid clashes between the Jewish people and the various empires that ruled over them. Only when there was no other recourse and the kingdom forced the Jewish people to violate their religion, did the sages call for rebellion. In the absence of religious persecution, however, they will try to find a way to reconcile with the kingdom. Accordingly, the Talmud relates that several other sages were once talking about the Roman Empire. Rabbi Yehuda ben Eli began the discussion with words of praise for the Romans, saying how pleasant are the deeds of this nation. They established marketplaces, erected bridges, and built bad houses. Even though Rabbi Yehuda knew that the Romans issued harsh, harsh decrees against the Jews, even destroying the Second Temple and killing hundreds of thousands of Jews during the Great Revolt and the Battle of the Revolt, the people to concentrate on the positive side of their rule in order to avoid heightening tensions. Rabbi Yossi referred to the silence. Apparently, he did not agree with Rabbi Yehuda's words of praise, but he did not want to denounce the Romans either. So, as not to create point of tension. Stop Rabbi there. So, who's talking? Who, who are the, the rabbis that are discussing? So, we have Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, <coughs> and Rabbi Shim Bar Yochai. Does anybody recognize those names? Right? The students of Rabbi Akiva, right? The five students of Rabbi Akiva but after the, the revolt, right? But did I say put Rabbi Yehuda? Was he not the rabbi? Was he a rabbi? Rabbi Yehuda. This is not Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. Not Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. No, this is Rabbi Yehuda Bar Eli. It's a different person. But you can say also Rabbi all the Tanaim in Eretz Israel, yeah, all the rabbis in Eretz Israel were called Rabbi. Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Meir, right? Rabbi Lazar ben Shamon. Here we have uh, them all having a, a discussion. They're having a beer, okay? <laughs> Along comes Rabbi Yehuda ben Eli says, wow, the Romans, look at what beautiful bathhouses they made. They made the streets. By the way, they uncovered in, in the city of David, the Roman street that was built by the Romans to going up to the Temple Mount where they used to have stores on either side and it's a massive, beautiful, they really, the Romans built beautiful uh, cities including the land of Israel. So Rabbi Yehuda Bar that was appreciating it. He said, wow, it's amazing. We never had such roads before. We never such had public bathhouses like this Roman Empire, they really invested a lot of money here. And it's, it's really beautiful. It's really great. Rabbi Yossi was uh, silent. He didn't want to get into trouble. Go ahead. Mm. Well, listen, the, the destruction had already happened. Right? So it's like Jews today maybe that are appreciating chutz arts, saying, wow, this, these goyim, they know. But this is in the land of Israel. This is in the land of Israel. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Rabbi Shema Bar Yochai, in contrast, was not unable. Go ahead. Rabbi Shema Bar Yochai, in contrast, was unable to tolerate words of praise for the evil Roman Empire. And he said, all that they build, they build solely for their own needs. They established marketplaces in which to station prostitutes, bedhouses in which to pamper themselves, and bridges from which to collect taxes. So, yeah, right. There, why did the Romans 
invest so much money in the infrastructure? Why did they build this beautiful uh, road that we can walk on today? I've been there, I've walked on it. We walk on this road going up to the Temple Mount. Why did they, why did they invest in all that? Commerce, they took, uh, they took the taxes. From all the, the greater the common, the greater the, 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 the society develops, the more money for the coffers of the Roman Empire. It was all part of their, their uh, self-interest. It's not that they wanted to be nice to us. So Rabbi Shimon Barachai is very uh, real politic, and, but he did not, he was not careful can you say, to say it quietly. Can you say it like, it's like the highways in Europe? But they say the demands made the highways nice, but we pay a lot of tax for the highways now. It's true, it's true, but nobody really assumes that um, it, it's highway robbery. <laughs> there's a price and there's a tax because, you know, it does cost money to have to keep the highway. If, you know, if the government was, was so corrupt yeah. that only, you know, 1% went to the actual highway and 99% was taken for the leaders to go and drive fancy cars yeah. and... and um, and uh, buy cigars, so then it would be more similar to what was going on here. And this is what Rabbi Shimon Bar Chai was saying, is that they're not really um, being, uh, being uh, upright, and there's a lot of corruption. Yes. But it's also like to infiltrate the culture, right? To, to bring the culture, all of those right. statues. Right, like, that's right. Helen, Alison, Helen. Well, that's Helen. in the Greek period, but the, the Romans also, they had their, yeah, definitely, the they wanted to... Yeah. Uh, for us to stop uh, uh, keeping our Judaism. So Rav Shiroh was very outspoken. Uh-oh. You ready? The Romans found out. Hirsch, you want to read for us? The bottom page 107? About six <laughs> lines from the end? Are you still haven't opened up? So I'll read a little bit. The Romans found out about this conversation and decreed. Rabbi Yehuda who praised us shall be promoted. Good. Well, most people don't talk about the Kitos war, but they ignore it. Apparently, Roman troops searched from, uh, for a rabbi Shimon by Yochai for years in order to kill him. The situation became so dangerous that rabbi Shimon by Yochai could no longer rely on his wife, so he and his son moved into a cave. Miraculously, a herald of trees found it outside the cave, and a spring began to flow there, providing them sustenance for 12 years, until they heard that the emperor had died and the decree was nullified. Rabbi Shimon by the high and his son reached such great heights in spirituality and asceticism while there. And when they left the cave, they could not tolerate all holy matters. Everywhere they looked, burst into flames. Consequently, they had to return to the cave for another year in order to delve deeper into the Torah and understand the value of this world. And only then did they leave the cave permanently, according to Shabbat. Okay, so this is the, I actually wanted to bring the original text in for you and to study with you. There's a, a, a fascinating uh, uh, description of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai coming out of the cave where he studied. What do you think he was studying there for, with his son? Maybe the Zohar. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe the Zohar. Maybe writing the Zohar, absolutely. <laughs> Studying the mystical <laughs> secrets, meditating with his son for 12 years. Maybe that's a symbolic number, but I don't know. But when they came out, what happened? It says that they came out, they, they saw somebody who was, who was rushing, who was, 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 was carrying things, and, and they asked him, what are you doing? He says, well, I need to uh, you know, get this produce to the market. And Rav Shimon Bar Yochai and his son, they were so shocked. And they said, this is what you care about? They peered at him and he, does. he died. <laughs> and the story is told 
a voice came out from heaven. Remember the voice from heaven? The batko. And said, return to your cave. You're not ready to interact with the world. And he went back for another year. Sounds like they learned something about how to interface with the world from the highest holy spiritual plane that they were on. And this time they came out and they saw a man, an old man who was running and he had two olive branches in his hands. And they asked him, where are you running? And why do you have olive branches in his hands? And he said, well, I'm running because it's Erev Shabbat. And I have to go to get ready for Shabbat. And he said, what's with the two olive branches in your hands? He said, one is symbolic of Zachor, and one is symbolic of Shamor, the two words that the Torah uses for to keep and to preserve, to, to remember the, the, the Shabbat. And this, they said, wow. We see, perhaps, this is my interpretation, we see that the matters of this world can be used in the worship of Hashem. The Jewish people are so holy that they're worshiping Hashem and keeping Shabbat within this world. And now they join society. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai came back and, and he tried to see, is there anything I can do to fix in this world? Can I uh, be of service? And they did some public works. And uh, their, so their second return seems to be a little bit more balanced between the high spiritual strivings and the, the mundane world that we live in and how to apply them. So uh, this, this interface between the, the high level of spirituality that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai represents and the mystical secrets, which really are something beyond what we can grasp in this world, how to implement them in this world this is the tension that Rav Shimon Bar Yochai was always involved in. Let's see one more example from Rav Melamed here on page 108. Um, David, another example on page 108. If a man flows at the time of flowing, plants at the time of planting, reaps at the time of time of reaping, threshes at the time of threshing, and winnows when it wind, when it's windy, what will be of the Torah? Whatever is really God's will, the work is done by others. And when they fail to do God's will, they do their own work, and even the work of others. The command concludes with the practical comment of uh, of life. Many have followed the advice of Rabbi Ishmael who advocated combining Torah study with the world occupation, and it has worked well. Others have followed Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and it has not been successful. Likewise, Rabbi instructed his students to work for two months of the year in order to support themselves. Admittedly, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's approach is not suitable for the public at large, and the necessities of life force, you, life force us to take its constraints into consideration in accordance with the view of most of the sages. Indeed, it is God's will that we work towards protecting the world by taking into account the obstacles in our way and without relying on the Nonetheless, it is very valuable to have a great Torah scholar who lives uh, his life according to eternal values, without compromise. This way, everyone can see tang tangibly, tangibly. Uh, tangibly the absolute adherence to Torah. It is true that practical decisions and general guidance for the public are determined by the majority of the sages of Israel, who take into account the limitation of this world to ex extend extenuating, extenuating? That's right, extenuating, yeah. Extenuating circumstances. Nevertheless, the grand vision of faith and redemption shines, from, shines forth from the strength of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who sacrifices himself for Israel's glory and its faith, establishing for future generations that the Roman Empire, which persecuted the Jews, was an evil kingdom. This is why the Jewish masses follow and venerate Rabbi Shon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shon Bar Yochai's focus on the esoteric side of the Torah is connected to his unique personality. By studying these dimensions of the Torah, one can connect better to one life beyond ordinary life in this world, to the eternal world, to Israel's unique character, and to the assurance of redemption. Such study underlays the person beyond our oh, opaque. Opaque, opaque and troublesome external existence 
and illuminates eternal concepts for him with the royal light. Okay, so this is a nice uh, description. We can see that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was, was uh, quite a powerful personality. One could say even an extreme personality. But uh, uh, there's, there's what to learn from extreme personalities, even though that's not the, the standard that we want to, uh, uh, you know, to, to pattern our, our lives after. The Rambam spoke about always going with the middle path, the golden path, the golden mean. Um, but there's a lot to be learned, a lot to be appreciated from the, uh, the pristine uh, ideals represented by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and of course the esoteric part is, is associated with that. Of um, We'll talk more about that, Bezrat Hashem, tomorrow. So far so good? Questions, comments? We haven't even gotten about the, to the bonfires yet, but uh, I, I want to I try to get there. Um, but I can't skip the, uh, the section about Rabbi Akiva. We have some time. So we'll try to uh, push it on ahead. Page 110, Rabbi Akiva. Okay? We've been learning about it. We mentioned Rabbi Akiva before, right? As the students of Rabbi Lezer and Rabbi Yeshua, the third generation. Shimon Bar Yochai, right? Rabbi Akiva, who had this, the 24,000 students that died, and he had the five students that survived and continued. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is one of them. So there was another rabbi mentioned in the previous uh, passage where he spoke about a machloket between how much you should uh, work versus study. And Shem Rechai said, you have to only study because if you work so much, you're never going to be able to learn Torah. Who disagreed with him? Rabbi Yishmael. Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Yishmael. Rabbi Yishmael was the, the, the partner in the third generation of Tanaim who uh, was a, ma- a major teacher in Judaism. And we're going to learn more about Rabbi Ishmael uh, soon. But uh, let's continue to talk about Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, how could he argue with Rabbi Ishmael? Well, he's the student of Rabbi Akiva, primarily the student of Rabbi Akiva. So when we have, we have a Midrash, it's fascinating. When we talk about Midrash as being a collection of Tanaitic work, so we have there's something called Midrash Halakha. Um, I'll put this up so people at home can see as well. Midrash Halakha, where we have the words of the sages collected, and Midrash actually means to derive. It's how we derive. We said from the Psukim, the Midrash is, is, is organized on, on the verses of the, of the Chumash itself. So when we have a Midrash Halakha, we find a fascinating phenomenon. On the book of Shemot, we have two versions of that Midrash Halakha. One is called, uh, the, 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 it's called the Mechilta, that's just a fancy name for the Midrash Halakha on the Book of Shemot. And we have the Mechilta, the Rabbi Yishmael. We also found in recent years, within the last hundred years, for years and years, the only copy that we have of a Midrash Halakha on the book of Shemot was from the school of Rabbi Ishmael. And then, about a hundred years ago, they discovered, I think it was in the Cairo Geniza, and there were, um, there were other uh, little snippets of manuscripts that were found here and there, and the scholars derived, you know what this is? This is the parallel. It's the Mechil. Again, the same word, it's a fancy word for the Midrash Halakha on Shemot, and it's known as the Mechilta of Rashbi. Why? Because he was, of course, a student of Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Akiva's approach, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Ishmael, they each have their own approach to Midrash, to how to derive things out of the Torah. I'm going to show you the book. We have the book in the English library, in English. Mechilta of Rabbi Ishmael. And we also have the other Midrashim I'm going to show you another day uh, when we have more time. I'll show you those books and I will bring in the Talmud that I, I, I didn't yet. Uh, but in any case, 
we have Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai as the continuation of Rabbi Akiva, and that's why here we have uh, an entire section here about Rabbi Akiva and his centrality in the uh, foundational period of the sages of the Jewish people. Okay, so let's read page one hundred and ten. Uh, Moshe, back to you. Where do you want me to start with that? Number four, Rabbi Akiva, page Number 110. Four, Rabbi Akiva, hidden within the Halula celebration of Lag Omer is another memorial, a memorial for the greatest exposit, expositor of the oral Torah, the wondrous Tana, Rabbi Akiva, one of whose five greatest disciples was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The Talmud relates that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai would encourage his students to review his own teachings because they were a condensed version of Rabbi Akiva's teaching. Teaching 167a. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai also learned that sacrificing self for Israel's honor from his master, as Rabbi Akiva supported the rebellion against the Romans and encouraged Bar Kokhba's revolt. In addition, the celebration of the esoteric Torah on Lago Omer is connected to Rabbi Akiva as well. It is said that Rabbi Akiva entered the Pardes, literally orchard, paradise, that is, the deep secrets of the Torah, and came out unscathed. Hagiga 14b. Maybe tomorrow we're going to see that passage and talk about it a little bit. This fascinating passage, again, tomorrow. about, uh, sorry? Tomorrow. I didn't say anything. Tomorrow, tomorrow. yeah, tomorrow. tomorrow. Tomorrow we have class. Tomorrow. Yeah, so tomorrow. Is uh, the, this idea of the entering the orchard. Mm, oh, yeah, this, this kind of story. Yeah, Hagiga 14b. Maybe tomorrow. Let's have the Go ahead. In contrast, the other sages who entered with him did not come out of the scale, as they were as they were incapable of absorbing the awesome secrets of the Pardes. The halachic reason given for rejoicing on Lag Omer revolves around the fact that Rabbi Akiva's disciples continued the tradition of the Torah, as we explained above in section one. After all, Rabbi Akiva is one of the pillars of the oral Torah. Rabbi Sadok Kohen of Lublin explained that the sages did not establish a halula on the anniversary of Rabbi Akiva's death. Because he was killed by the government. Therefore, they established the Hilula on the day his student, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, died. Thus, it turns out that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's Hilula includes Rabbi Akiva's Hilula as well. Therefore, it is appropriate to focus on Rabbi Akiva's teachings and greatness on Lag Omer. There was almost no one who began studying Torah under worse conditions than Rabbi Akiva. Nonetheless, by virtue of his diligence and great faith, he reached the loftiest heights to a large extent. He reached the loftiest heights. To a large extent, this was the wife, Rachel, the daughter of Kalvat Sabua, one of the wealthiest Jews of the age. She recognized the greatness of his soul and promised that she would marry him if he would study Torah. Her wealthy father disowned her as a result, but she refused to change her mind, marrying Rabbi Akiva and becoming one of the poorest Jews of the tribe. Despite all of this, she continued with great self sacrifice to encourage her husband to study Torah. After Rabbi Akiva became the greatest Torah sage of his generation, he said to his students, My knowledge and your knowledge are truly heard. Stop there for a second. Did anybody recognize this phrase? Mine and yours is it are from, hers. Uh, is it from Vishis um, No, no, it's from here. This is the source. Rabbi Akiva said it. But who else said it to us about two months ago? Sitting on a low stool. Was it in the, uh, was it in the Miguel Sester? Rav, Rav Bigun, he oh. said that. Remember that? Yeah. Oh. Bigun was sitting oh. Shiva for his wife, oh. and he said, everything that I've done, mine, and therefore yours, all of his students, are all thanks to her. He was quoting Rabbi Akiva, about, who said that about Rachel. Rabbi is sitting here with us, how can you be here in Jerusalem when your wife is so far away while well, she enables you to come and to, to, to study Torah with us? It's to, to be such a, what a, what a uh, wonderful thing that you're able to, to study with us. What do they say in, uh, in the, I don't know where it comes from, behind every great man. He's a, he's a great woman, right? <laughs> so this is the story of Rabbi Kiva and Rachel, and of course it's not easy to get along with women, but, and they say the same thing, it's not easy to get along with men. We have our challenges, but ultimately when it works, 
and uh, you have dedication to a common goal. It's, uh, it's amazing. And even though the, the, the man might be the one studying the Torah, especially historically, women didn't even know how to read and write. Um, and the, the, the role of being the Torah scholars and the rabbis was primarily, and still is, uh, primarily the job of the man. Still, it's not that the women have no part in it. They have a tremendous part in it because they uh, sacrifice and they, uh, they encourage their husband to study Torah, like Rachel did for Rabbi Akiva. Okay, go ahead, Moshe. Rabbi Yehuda said, in the name of Ra, when Moshe ascended high, uh, ascended on high, he found the Holy One, blessed be he, engaging in a fixing coronet of the letters. He said to him, Master of the universe, who is preventing you? Who needs these precise coronets? No one understands their meaning anyway. God responded to him, There will arise a person many generations from now, named Akiva ben Yosef, who will derive heaps of laws from every jot. Moshe replied, Master of the universe, if you have such a man and you are giving the Torah through me, he replied, Be silent. This is what arose when, in my thoughts. Nachot 29b. The fact that God showed uh, Moshe, Rabbi Akiva, specifically from among all the sages of Israel, indicates that he is considered the greatest expositor of the oral Torah. See also in San Hendred 86a, where the Gemara states that all anonymous halachic teachings stem from him. Rabbi Akiva's dedication to faith in God... So just stop there for one second. Remember we talked about the Mishnah? Who wrote the Mishnah? Who edited the Mishnah? Collected the Mishnah? Uh, Rebbe. Rebbe. Who? Rebbe. Rebbe. Correct. Rebbe. So Rebbe, he took from all the traditions of all the rabbis, all the Tanaim, Primarily, he took from the school of Rabbi Akiva, the teachings through his Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi. So when you see a Mishnah, which doesn't say any name, there's no name, there's no attribution to any specific sage, the standard approach is to assume this was a teaching, was brought down from, Rabbi Akiva. So you can see the essential, the book of Judaism, the entire Mishnah is all stemming from Rabbi Akiva. Okay? Go ahead. The fact that God showed Moshe. We did that. Right, next. No, uh, Rabbi Akiva's yeah. dedication. Rabbi Akiva's dedication to faith in God and Torah was boundless. Even after 24,000 of his students died, he did not lose faith. Rather, he continued to teach more students who proceeded to spread Torah throughout Israel. When he saw a fox leaving the sight of the Holy of Holies and his colleagues cried, he began to rejoice because of his faith, that just as the prophet's warnings of disaster came through, so too will their words of consolation. 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 You know that story, right? Yes. Rabbi Kiva uh, laughing because maybe he had a vision of the future or, or he had faith that uh, were part of a longer process in history to make tremendous, tremendous depth and, and foresight to be able to appreciate that, even when you're seeing the horrible, horrible destruction, to appreciate that there is hope and faith. Go ahead. When the Romans yeah. issued a decree prohibiting Torah study, Rabbi Akiva sacrificed himself by teaching Torah to the masses. He was eventually caught, incarcerated, and sentenced to a cruel death. The sages say, when Rabbi Akiva was taken out for execution, it was the time to recite the Shema. And while they combed his flesh with iron combs, he was accepting upon himself the yoke of the king, the ship of heaven, by reciting the Shema. His disciples said to him, Our master, even to this point, one is exempt from reciting the Shema under such excruciating circumstances. Why then are you exerting yourself so greatly to read it now? He said to them, All my days I have been troubled by the verse, with all your soul, which I attribute to mean that one must love God, even if he takes your soul. I said, when, I, when will I have the opportunity to fulfill this? Now that I have the opportunity, shall I not fulfill it? He prolonged the word Echad in the verse, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, Echad, until his soul departed while saying it. A heavenly voice went forth and proclaimed, Happy are you, Akiva, that your soul has departed with the word Echad. A heavenly voice went forth and proclaimed, Happy are you, Rabbi Akiva, for you are destined for life in the world to come. <laughs> Ready for bonfires? Tonight's the night. So you gotta you gotta know the laws. The truth is, who can guess 
what kind of laws are there going to be about bonfires? Don't be stupid. Go off that, which is more important. Good. What else? Don't make it too big. Don't make it too big. I hear that. But what else? There's no message to do with you, can you imagine that there was various traditions and customs that developed over the years? You can still see it today sometimes. People really get into the bonfire. They get into the bonfire? No, 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 no. That. <laughs> <laughs> Not themselves, but what do they put into the bonfire? Oh, the clothes. Yes. yes. Clothes. Sometimes they would put clothing or expensive items yeah. into the bonfire. It's a little bit of like a, a an element of sacrifice. It is. I'm giving it to... Is. Right. It is. It is. Which is, of course, very problematic in it Judaism. Is. What is it? Well, obviously, we don't have sacrifices outside the temple, and we shouldn't... What else? There's a prohibition that we learned about. Uh, those who were with me uh, six months ago, we learned it's a prohibition called Baal Tashrit. What does that mean? Do not destroy. You don't have to destroy no, things in the world, right? You're not, you're not allowed to just... Wantonly uh, do acts of destruction. You're supposed to preserve the world, preserve the environment. Even preserve. flies, right? Even flies, well, if it's bothering you, then that's allowed. But if it's okay. for no good reason, why should you take a, a perfectly good jacket or shirt and put it into the fire? It's baltashrit. So this is a, an element of, of course, you want to make a bonfire. So you take things that are already ruined, things that are not going to be used, wood that's that's you know, out of out of shape and it's it's not useful for, for building anymore. But to take now they get really into the bonfire. So a lot of people get really into on their own, they pour oil and more oil and more oil. And every they, they consider that every act of pouring another bottle of water on the bonfire is some kind of a religious ritual. This is really strange. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Torah. Right, the whole concept of having a bonfire is it? the whole concept of having a festival on Lag Bomer doesn't it really uh, have the ancient uh, sources. So we have to be very careful that we want to appreciate Rabbi Akiva, we appreciate Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, we want to get close to the tzaddikim, we want to uh, accept upon ourselves the revealed Torah and the hidden Torah, but we can't step over the line and forget about. The, the, the revealed Torah. So let's see what he says about the laws of Lag Vomer. Um, David, will you read for us page yes. 112, number 5? One first on Lag Vomer. For hundreds of years, there has been a custom to light a large bonfire near Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's grave on the Mount of Neron in honor of his Hilula. Hasidim had the custom to light bonfires in other places uh, as well. Some light candles in the synagogues in commemoration of the Hilula. Candles and light allude to Torah and so as it says, for the commandment is a candle and the Torah is light. Why is a wonderful thing. Out of inanimate cold blocks, a point suddenly comes forth a flame that has tremendous power to give light and warmth and to burn. This is why Torah, Torah and Mitzvot are compared to fire and flame. If one studies the Torah and observes the Mitzvot in this dark, cold world, one gains everlasting illumination. Hasidim customarily light bonfires in Lag Bohomer to illuminate the great light of the Torah secret that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai revealed. The Zohar relates that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai revealed great secrets to, the, to his students on the day he died, which were recorded in the Ida Zutta, and his students could not draw near to him because of the great fire that surrounded him. Nevertheless, we must emphasize that the customs of rejoicing in Lag Bohomer are not obligatory. Neither Rambam nor Shulchan Aruch rule that one must light a bonfire on Lag Boomer or visit the grave of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Furthermore, many great Torah scholars disregard these customs altogether. So we're going to skip section 6 just because we're running out of time. We're going to go to section 7, of throwing clothes into the bonfire and praying at the grave sites of Tzadikim, because that's practical uh, for tonight. Yes? Ariel, so, good morning. In the period of the Omer, how we like um, don't rejoice, and there's like right. We covered that. Everybody agrees. Seven. Yeah, everybody Lock agrees. Lock Omer, obviously can, like, so everybody agrees first. about the about the singing and dancing and playing musical instruments. About the haircutting, there's different traditions. Right. Ashkenazi approach, Sephardi approach, Lock with Omer. many details. Uh, Sephardi, most Sephardi, just to give you the uh, summary. I know that you follow Sephardi traditions, right? Yeah. Most Sephardi uh, do not cut their hair until the morning of the 34th of the Omer. 
uh, but the celebrations, of course, are allowed uh, otherwise. Um, okay, so let's skip to page 115. <coughs> Throwing clothes into the bonfire. Amos, will you read for us, please? Many people had a custom to throw expensive clothing, clothing in the bon, bon, bon bonfire at Meron, explaining that they do so in honor of Rav Shimon Bar Yochai. There are even testimonies that great rabbis follow this practice. Follow this practice. One the, on the other hand, some authorities are skeptic about this practice, claiming that it it has no basis on and words that is forbidden because of Baal Tesh Tashkid. The prohibition, prohibition against destroying things needless, needlessly. It is true that people used the, to burn the, the king's clothes after his death, but that was because no one else may use them out of honor for the king. Here, however, why should we burn clothing for no reason? Others try to justify the custom, saying that one transgress the prohibition of Baal Tash Tashhit only when to destroy something for truly no reason, but if there is a purpose like honoring Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, it is permissible. In practice of one's, ancest one, one's ancestors did not follow the practice, it is inappropriate for him to observe such a dispute custom. But if one ancestor had the custom to burn clothes, one may rely on the poskim who justify the custom. Nevertheless, it is preferable to, do, to donate the value of the clothing to charity than to destroy them in fire. Okay, uh, yeah, so it's not encouraged here by Rabbi Malamed, but the custom does exist and uh, I, I see. I think. I think it's quite rare. Although sometimes the kids, the kids who make the bonfires, they go crazy. And there's one other element that you, you have to be careful about and teach your kids, and that is there's another prohibition in the Torah. You might have heard of it. Do not steal. Sometimes they'll take wood from somebody's private yard and without asking permission. You can Well, it's for log bomber, but you can't steal. Because you need some wood for your bonfire, you have to be very careful. Shut up. So uh, the last thing I just want to finish up because we have to. Uh, we're going to go to a party. Right? We're going to go to a gathering soon. I want to finish up, and I'll take your question later. The last thing he says here is that when going to pray at the gravesite, if anybody has, uh, is planning to go to Miron, saints and sages, one must be careful not to turn toward them in prayer, because we're commanded to pray to God alone. There would be a violation of the prohibition to pray to them. So there's some people that say so you can't even pray innocent, like you can't like actually dab in a cemetery. You can't home That's right. Dab. That's right. You have to be forced for a month away. Some authorities permit that you to actually speak to the saint, to the to the to the holy tzaddik, and ask him to pray for you. So you're not praying to him. You're, you are speaking though to him and ask him to pray for you. The concept is that his soul is still alive and his soul might be able to intercede on your behalf. Others say, no, that's also too close and only pray to God. You're allowed to say, I'm praying to God and I'm hoping that the merit of praying near such the grave of such a tzaddik will help my prayers be received on high. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, by connecting to the Torah teachings and good deeds of the righteous person, we become better, more perfect people. And in that merit, we ask God to accept our prayers. We stop here with the chef, and see you soon downstairs in the uh, gathering. Right?